dealt with six parts of this, and this one I was sort of uh, brought to attention that I had to bring it forward, and that is when there, this condition of self-importance comes in, where it says, I make the rules. Why does a person victimize others and then declare, I make the rules, I'm right, I make the rules? It is more than just dealing with a bully. And bullies like to make their own rules. It is more than just dealing with a stressed out, parent or mate or demagogue friend or government official or things. And uh, you know, we do have to deal with them. Uh, I mean, a lot of police officers will actually declare, I make the rules. You do what I say, I make the rules. And they do that and they say it because they really want to bully people around, not for their, anybody else's good, but just to bully. But that's not the type that we're going to look at here. A person or government, government agency that claims I make the rules, has deep, shall we say, debilitating, uh, mental and spiritual problems. They're not all there. Something else is there controlling them. And they're often too self-absorbed, too self-important, or too self-aggrandizing to accept correction or acknowledge a need for correction on anything in their life. They're just intransient. Even if they claim to be teachable, this self-important uh, syndrome that they're in, I make the rules, shoots down the logic and moral section of their brain. It just shuts it down. And they don't recognize it. They can be extremely cruel when they don't recognize it. So, why does that develop? They are in need to victimize and uh, compensate for a loss of identity. So because they don't have an identity of who or what they are, they actually have to bully or, or um, undermine and put others down. And they form these um, cult-styled groups around them. Uh, that they have uh, also no identity within them. Like they get groups together that will support one that's really aggressive. but they don't stop and consider what they're doing. It's just they have no identity and they gather around those that have no identity. And they have this reliance on an ever-changing set of rules for justification of what they do and condemning what you do. It's never up to satisfaction. They claim to be their own God, in other words. So they must persecute anyone 
who opposes or corrects them for being a god, their own god. After all, they're so right that they're invincible. You know? And three, they are very insecure. And you have to understand this form of insecurity. Uh, it is so predominant that anything that uh, would even attempt to show the right way has to be reacted in anger, vulgarity, or cursing. They can't respond one-on-one -on -one or have a real conversation with you. They look at any challenge or any question to them as you're challenging their Godhead that they're very insecure about. And we know that um, many of the religious institutions that train pastors and priests and that um, actually train them to persecute anybody that doesn't worship them. Yeah. And worship their rules. They want their rules worshipped. Even if they change them every few minutes, they still want them worshipped. Mm -hmm. They did it, you better be in touch with it. Uh, they employ verboseness to cover up their fears, ignorance, and lack of wisdom. You get people that they just keep talking, they don't want to hear anything you've got to say. They just keep talking over you. Well, a person that is in the state of I make the rules is very, very prone to shout you down or over talk you so they don't have to listen to anything that might correct them. And no matter how much lack of wisdom they show, you can't point it out to them that what they're saying and doing is not wise. You know? Unless you want to get killed or something, you know, beat up, smashed around. Um, five is they pride themselves on stubbornness, religiosity, and traditions that they have decided to keep. So if they're keeping it, you're wrong for not keeping it. <laughs> um, and this is regardless of the amount of stupidity involved. It, does, it doesn't matter how stupid the situation is, they will insist that they're right because they they make the rules. They got they got the authority. They gave themselves the authority and they got the authority and you better not walk on it. Now, some declare this is a boundary protection that they establish. No, it isn't. Boundaries is when you know what's right and wrong and you choose to do what's right. If you break some what's right for somebody else in their life, you're breaking their boundary. Now, with those in mind, how do they attack you? What, what's their modus operandi? Well, first, they yell and scream to block sound thinking in their victims. If they choose that you're weaker than them and they've got to push you around, they will yell and scream at you until you do what they want you to do. A victim always produces second thoughts of what they should have said, what uh, 
what they should have done or a list of uh, could uh, could have been you know but they don't look at it as why am I submitting to this why am I involved And what you find out is when you look into it deeply that you have the slave mentality that was established by Egypt. You want to get abused. The second thing they do is they use anger and intimidation to push their victims down into submission. You know, they just... You never know when they're going to rise up in anger and strike you. Even if you haven't done anything. Um, they will often rely on drink, you know, uh, getting themselves drunk to... Uh, let's say, justify raping another or stealing from somebody or uh, squandering, uh, let's say, the food money for the month for the family. It's, you know, well, you can't charge me with it because I was drunk. But they deliberately they got themselves drunk so they could blow them up and punish everybody. Three, they use threats of support, withdrawal, um, or eviction, and or physical harm to get their way. If you don't do what I say, I'm, I'm going to cut off all your money for this month, this coming month. You won't have any. You don't have to. Find your own, just like Pharaoh said, go find your own straw now. You don't agree with me, go find your own straw. Well, that's the approach they take. Four is, if all else fails, they threaten suicide or the killing of a family, pet, or even a child to get their way. Um, I remember we counseled one man back in, I think it was 99, 2000, something like that. And he threatened to rape his children if his wife didn't submit to allow him to have girlfriends come and sleep in the bed with him that night. Well, you know, why would you do that? <laughs> well, sex is they will sabotage their job to bring about submission and sympathy support and condemnation of their former bosses even. They sabotage their job, get fired, and then blame their boss for firing them. Yeah. And if you don't sympathize with them, you get the same treatment. Seven, they have a habit of exaggerating things. They love to gossip and create stories to attack all who challenge their self-imposed right to rule. And this is really interesting because they cannot keep a secret. They have to blab everything. Six. 
seven. Uh, it's seven, that was seven, but the with its gossip and creating stories to attack, uh, you may not find out all the things they said for years after, and you wonder why people are shunning you. But it's because of what they've said. Eight is they refuse to see cause and effect connections. Okay, what happens when you fail to see a cause and effect connection? Well, you live in fantasy land. You create a situation in which you're in fantasy land. So, uh, they insist that the victim is the cause and perpetrator of everything that goes wrong in their life. If they have chosen you to be the victim, you're responsible for things that happened even before they were born. Even if you were born 20 years after them. <laughs> and really. Number nine. Everyone is evaluated as to their value in relationship as a sex slave. Not a person, but how will you be able to sexually please them? And it's also, they appraise you as to your value as a donkey, a work animal. Are you going to be able to work lots for them? Can they man manipulate you into doing things? And they also value, uh, evaluate you as to whether you're going to be a good whipping boy. Now, what happens there? See. When they're assessing what they're going to do or how, how valuable you're going to be to them, it goes under those three categories. But what if they've chosen you to be the whipping boy? That they're going to take all their frustrations and abuse and uh, dissatisfaction out on you. That's a hard thing to deal with because there's no pleasing such a person. There's no ability to make peace with this person. Okay? They're a constant torment. Once they have pointed you out as their whipping boy, even if you're the mate, uh, you know, or you're married to them, and there is no way you can get peace. They make the rules. 10. They compete, belittle, abuse, and demotivate their children so that they will not succeed in life or become better than they are. Very hard to deal with. Number 11, they are very intolerant with anyone who does not make uh, their acceptance level. And very hostile to authorities that they cannot control. So if the authority can't be bought or persuaded or controlled over to their way of thinking, uh, they become very hostile to them. Number 12, they become unable to handle money, paperwork, and government tax forms. This is too much of a challenge to 
I make the rules, identity, that they use uh, to pry their, their support lines with their, their identity. So they got to put the onus on somebody else. They have to create the paths, in other words. And if you need a review of it, check violation of the Patsy Syndrome. Um, number 13. Um, my time is way more valuable than yours. So, uh, don't ask me to do anything for you. I'll ask you to do things for me, but don't you dare ask me to do anything for you. They, and number 14, they are very prone to brag about their superiority. Their physical stature or proudness. Their uh, immortality. You will die, but not them. And this is devastating when it comes between a husband and a wife. Because even if it started off with love, what they're trying to do is destroy it and kill their man. And because they consider themselves are seeking to become immortal through physical means, their own strength. Uh, it's amazing what they'll spend money on to try and have that immortal connection. And it just, you know, as they see things failing in their own physical body, they take it out on their mate. They punish their mate for them losing their grandness in their uh, immortality. And in these things, we have a summated point here is they are perfect and justified because they make the rules that not even God himself could argue with. So the more you are intimidated and submissive to them, the more perfect and righteous they become in their own sight. And you're always in the wrong, and they're always in the right then. Because they make the rules, and you don't know how to keep them. So how do you get free from being the victim of a person that's stuck in I make the rules or uh, you might be living with one or no one that's influencing your life well first you have to forgive the self-important victimizer and I mean, really forgive them to, from your heart and let, that, let them go and be under the control of your Father in Heaven. Two, you have to remove all soul ties, bonds, vows, compacts, attachments, and nets of intimidation from you. Because not only will they attack you with the saw of intimidation, but they wrap you up in this net so you can't get away. You're stuck. You're like a fish stuck, it has its gills stuck in a gill net. You can't get out. So until these are removed and broken off, a sound relationship can never be formed.
one of the parties has to break it off for the other to really be dealt with if they're married. Um, three, remove all labels and welded labels and badges of dishonor. You will be surprised how many accumulate when you're dealing with somebody that has this self-importance and I make the rules. Four is remove and break off all curses, spells, and incantations because they will use these even though they may not even recognize that they're doing it. They will use them on you. Five is remove and break off all false identities, false hopes, false humility, and false security. Because if you're hanging on to that person as a sense of security, you got the wrong, you're holding on to the wrong thing. It's like putting your hand on one of those gas uh, burners that is all lit and wondering why your hand's burning. Wake up. All things that are false have to get broken off. Six, turn over all pain, agony, anger, regrets, and all self-worthlessness, uselessness, and unwantedness. If you don't turn those over, those demons will continue to possess you. So if you don't turn the rights over for them to be there, you can't get rid of them. And you'll go right back into the same state, only much worse. Seven is acknowledge the false gods and false worship uh, that you yielded, that made you a victim of self-importance. See, if you didn't have a false god there and uh, producing false wor worship, you would have set up the boundaries right off and put a, an end to the charade. Um, eight is ask for forgiveness and the correct identity and to be restored, to have a restored relationships under the discernment of the Father of Love. Let him be the guide of all things. Nine is thank our Father for the hand of Yeshua to walk us through the pain and sorrow of being involved with such people. There's no joy in being connected to somebody that has this form of self-importance where they make the rules. And all they produce in you is a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, and you start to neglect your relationship with your father and with Yeshua because of it. And number 10, thank our Father for the joy of Yeshua and His peace to be able to deal with those consumed by self-importance. I make the rules. If you are the self-important one that I make the rules we're talking to and want to be set free, then start with 
a request of I want to be one able to forgive myself because a person that gets into this I make the rules can't forgive themselves so they got to make others suffer Second is able to forgive parents. This is a trait, a hand-me-down trait from father to son or father to daughter, but it follows the male of the line more than the female. It follows the male of the family. Three, able to seek forgiveness from those injured and victimized. Four, able to seek help to change your vision, your direction, and your purpose in life. Five, is able to let others grow in their anointing. And this is very important. Because one that I make the rules kills other people's anointings. Six is able to let go, let others uh, be blessed to prosper. You see, they have a squandering spirit. And a person with a squandering spirit won't let other people prosper. And seven, able to serve in love and encouragement. Now, you can't ask for just one. You have to be willing to ask your father for all of this in order to start the process of breaking free. Not just what suits you for the moment, but all of these have to be dealt with. And you can go back over the things of where have you caused pain by just looking what you with these previous uh, points of concern are. All aspects for victim or victimizers are requiring a new moon lay down. You cannot just go, this is something where you got to come to the altar and actually lay it down. So in closing, we pray that you have the strength and wisdom to grab hold of this revealed knowledge to be set free and to walk in the fullness of shalom and all the 75 blessings related, or 73 blessings related to it. In Yeshua's name, amen and amen. Amen.